There are words in the Christian faith that are very churchy. Churchy words that a lot of us have heard, and we, we may have an assumption of what they mean, but maybe we don't have a complete full grasp on them. Here's some good churchy words for you. Eucharist. Anybody use that in a sentence this week? Can't wait till we get together and celebrate the Eucharist, right? I didn't use that word this week at all. How about sacrament or synoptic? How about transubstantiation? That's like a $7 word right there. Uh, the apocrypha or atonement. These are very churchy words, right? They're used to describe churchy things. They're good words, and we should know them. We should know what they mean and have an understanding about them. And, but there's a word that I want to focus on this morning. It's very religious, and it's very easy to assume that we all know what it means. But do we really know what it means? And it's the word sanctify. Sanctify in the Greek is pronounced hagiadzo, hagiadzo. So most of the New Testament is written in Greek, translated over the years, and Greek to Latin to all kinds of different languages, German to English, it, there's a lot of times when the translation doesn't do how we talk good justice for our, our understanding. And so this word sanctify in the Greek, it is a verb. It is an action word. It defines an action that comes from making decisions, right? The root of this Greek word sanctify is the word hagios, which is translated how we say holy. So the root of the word sanctify is holy, much like the root of the word running is the word run, right? The word hagios is used all through New Testament scriptures, the word holy. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, when describing when Mary uh, submits to the Lord. Uh, now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the hagios spirit, the Holy Spirit. This word de describes God. He is blameless. He is pure. He is consecrated. He is sacred. And the word sanctified, it could be defined as the actions of becoming holy. Much like the word run describes or defines an action, the word running places the subject doing the action. Right? Run identifies what the action is. Running tells us what is the present action. Holy defines what the status of God is. It defines who God is at his core, his, his character. God is blameless, pure, sacred, hagios. Sanctify means they are the actions, they are the activities that we do that allow us to become holy. The word sanctify means to separate from profane things, it means to dedicate to God. It means to consecrate things to God, to purify. It means to cleanse. That's what sanctify means. And there is a passage that I want us to land on in the book of John chapter 17. If you have your Bibles or tablets or phones, get them out, open them. We're going to land here for a little while. John 17. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. John records an extremely special moment in human history. In, the, in chapter 17. Matter of fact, chapters 13 all the way to 18 are a unique part of the New Testament because 13 to 18 is all one linear moment in time. And John is recording this linear moment and he records something that is not recorded in other gospels. He's a glimpse into the personal prayer life of Jesus. We know that Jesus taught his disciples in the beginning of Matthew. They said, how do, you, we, how do we pray, Lord? And he said, well, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But it wasn't Jesus praying at that moment. He was teaching his disciples to pray. So we don't really see a lot of intimate, in-depth view of Jesus' prayer life until we get to John chapter 17 and 18. And in John chapter 17, I'm going to start in verse 17. And here's something, I'm just going to take a quick excerpt out of, out of the middle of his prayer. Jesus is talking to his father. He's talking about his disciples and the disciples that are to come in the future. 
sanctify them by your truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world I also have sent sent them into the world and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth if we don't understand the word sanctify and understand the gravity like Jesus says it three times right here we don't understand it we've got to figure it out we have to understand it this is a passage where Jesus is praying and he uses this word three different times what is he saying sanctify it's also by the way the word hallowed when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray and he says our father who are in heaven hallowed be your name that is the same word he uses in this passage that is translated sanctify make them holy John chapter 17 17 if you paraphrased what Jesus is saying in a way that we could hopefully understand better he's saying make them holy by your truth I make myself holy that they may be made holy all right the word that Jesus uses here extremely heavy I want to read also from this chapter chapter 17 and I want us to understand its context you have to read scripture in context you can't just pluck out a verse and make it a doctrine you have to understand who is speaking who they speaking to what is happening in the surrounding area so in John chapter 17 here is the moment from chapter 13 to chapter 18 Jesus meets with his disciples in in this sacred last meal with them he's doing the Passover for the very last time with his disciples he instigates Holy Communion or as we would call it a very churchy word the Eucharist which is another churchy word a sacrament right so there you go now that now you know how to use those in this moment Jesus washes the disciples feet he talks to them about his crucifixion coming up in this moment he dips some bread in oil and passes it to Judas and Judas immediately gets up and walks out of the building and heads down the road to go betray Christ to the religious Jewish leaders and Jesus begins to tell his disciples encouraging commands love me by following my commands love each other as I have loved you he tells them let's get up and leave from this place and they walk out of the city of David down the Kidron Valley up starting to go up the Mount of Olives which is next door to the to the city of David and they go into the garden there on the Mount of Olives where Jesus is going to spend a lot of time in prayer for the next few hours before he is arrested and then taken off to be tortured crucified and buried and right before all of that happens he allows his disciples to hear him pray and he's praying for them and I want us to dive deep into what he says as he's praying for not only again his disciples in the moment but also for his disciples that he knows are going to come I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one they are not of the world just as I am not of the world sounds to me like Jesus is saying set them apart set them aside let them be a consecrated holy thing sanctify them by your truth what a great segue Lord make them holy by your truth your word is truth you sent me into the world and I also have sent them into the world and for their sakes I sanctify myself now why would Jesus have to do this wasn't he already holy wasn't Jesus already holy here listen to what he says in other places in the scripture what did Jesus say he says I only do what I see my father doing I only say what I hear my father saying that's what he is meaning I sanctify myself my actions the verb of my life is that I am acting holy doing what my father wants me to do and saying what my father wants me to say going where my father wants me to go I sanctify myself that they also may 
do the same thing. Sanctified by the truth. And I do not pray for these alone, and here's where he prays for you and I. But for those who will believe in me through, through their word, that they may be that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, and though, and and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and you have loved them as you have loved me. Now, I love to get into different commentaries to, to understand the depth of words, because English is a difficult language. It's probably one of the worst languages on the planet. Matthew Henry is a theologian from many centuries back. He wrote six commentaries on the New, New and Old Testament. I highly encourage you to, to look into that. Now here's what Matthew Henry says about this passage, verse 17 in particular. Father, sanctify them. What it really means, he's, what, is, what, what Matthew Henry is interpreting it to say is, Lord, confirm the work of sanctification in them, strengthen their faith, inflame their good affections, rivet their good resolutions. Carry on that good work in them and continue it. Let it shine more and more. Complete it. Crown it with the perfection of holiness. That's what Jesus is praying for us. Now, it is true that there is no work you or I could ever do to add to what Christ accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. Salvation and forgiveness for sin was purchased by Christ by his death, burial, and resurrection. And because of the finished work on the cross and the resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God found in Scripture, we should be submitting to the act of sanctification with every step of our life. And that's on us. And in the evangelical Protestant Reformation of the last 400 years, much of the focus has been put on the, the statement, Jesus has made me holy. I am justified by Christ and his atonement. Hallelujah, that is true. Amen? I'm thankful that I, that is the foundation of our relationship with Christ. But too much focus on that. If you just say that, it is easy to be tempted to leave behind the aim we have for perfection because why try to be holy if Christ has already made me holy? How many of you are holy this morning? That's a hard question. Only two of you got it right. Because in view of God what does God see he sees the righteousness of Christ when he looks upon us right now how many of you act holy that's a better answer how many of us can be holy here's our problem we don't think we can make it we don't think we can be holy we don't think and so because Jesus is holy for me I don't have to try to be holy because Jesus says, Jesus paid it all. That means I got a good debit card. Swipe it, Jesus. Forgive me again. If I can be forgiven and am forgiven, why do I still have to strive for perfection? What a great whisper the enemy puts in our ear. Much of this comes from reading passages like Romans 8 and seeing only those parts that make us feel good about Christ's atoning sacrifice. And here's the danger of pulling out only one part of Scripture and making a doctrine on it. Because what Paul writes is true, but if you only focus on this one part, you miss the bigger context. Here's what he says, Romans 5, 6. When we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Hallelujah. Amen? For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah, get up and run, amen? That's good news right there. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thank God, hallelujah, it's all a party, right? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That is awesome. 
I mean, that is worth standing up and shouting until you cannot shout anymore. And, but many Christians read a passage like this and have, they have an elementary understanding of what Christ has done and, and also an elementary understanding of the response to his actions, what it should be. And the knowledge that when we accept Christ, we are reconciled to God. It is such an important foundation in our relationship with Christ. And many receive this knowledge and settle into a lukewarm lifestyle of Christianity because they don't understand fully what the word reconciliation means. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a statement like, now that I'm saved, I don't have to aim for perfection or strive for it because Jesus did it for me. It's not what it means. It also doesn't mean a statement like this. I can live my life with willful and conscious compromise and unrighteous living because in Christ, I'm righteous in God's eyes. It also is not this. God knows I'm not holy, so I don't have to be. Jesus was holy for me. And I think that last statement is the one that most of us are closest to. Well, God knows I can't be holy. Thank God for his grace. Paul continues his letter. And remember that Romans is not divided up by chapters and verses when Paul writes it. It's one continuous thought. And when you look over in chapter 6 of this continuous thought in this doctrine, he writes about the response that we should have in coming into salvation and relationship with Jesus. And he says this, Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, have, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a lot. That is a lot to look at, a lot to take in. If I could condense that down to John David's understanding, if I could figure out how, to, how do I say that in one sentence... I'd say it like this, Jesus is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. He cannot be partially Lord. And many people will make a commitment to Christ and they will receive assurance of being reconciled, saved, cleansed. They will become a Christian. A lot of us became Christians because it was for our benefit not because of who Jesus is. Come to Christ and he'll X, Y, Z. Come to Christ and he'll do this. Come to Christ and you'll get, come to Christ. If we, we come to Christ because it, it is for our benefit, not coming to Christ because of who he is. He is Lord. And still remain in a state of life where they are not chasing after holiness. And I qualify for that statement. I am not continually chasing after holiness. I stand before you as one who's, who's trying my best not to be hypocritical this morning because I want my life to follow Christ, but I keep on carrying this carcass around and feeding it and still doing some of the same old stuff that I should have put to death already. Jesus' prayer in John 17 was sanctify them, make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. You sent me into the world. I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I have made myself holy, sanctify myself, that they may make themselves holy by the truth. Make them holy by your truth. I make myself holy that they may be made holy. 
We who accept this gift of salvation, we must also understand that God has a single desire for all of us, that we choose to live our lives by his word, and that every choice that we make resembles being holy. But many of us don't choose this. We don't choose this because perhaps we calculate, because there's grace and mercy, I am holy in God's eyes. Jesus did it for me, so I don't have to. And church, this is a great offense to the Lord. It is a great offense to God. It is an offense to the Lord not to strive for holiness in every decision and every action. Because God has given us power from the Holy Spirit all the power that we need to live lives that honor him, but too often we choose to live lives that offend him, counting on his grace to cover our sin, and that offends the Father. What does the action of sanctification look like in real life? It means choosing to walk as Jesus did. That's what it looks like. Choosing to live like Jesus did and nothing else. Nothing else. The word run, it describes an action. The word running tells what the subject is doing. Holy describes who God is. Sanctification is the action of becoming like Him in all of our decisions. And Paul, the apostle, he, he's the one that wrote, wrote Romans. In another letter he wrote to the church of Ephesus in chapter 4. Take your Bible and turn there. You'll need, to, you'll need to have a reference for this. And this is something that I want you to live in for the rest of the week, reading the book of Ephesians. In the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, instructs the church that because of the love of Christ for us, he laid down his life. Because we understand that love, we should lay down our life, every part of our life for him, and that our choices reflect his holiness. Right? And here's the way sanctification, the process, running with Jesus, here's what it actually looks like in the flesh. Are you ready? Here's what Paul says, Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus." that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Who, who is that on? It's on me. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Who is that on? That's on me. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. We're members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Well, whoop, stop. <laughs> Can't do that one, Jesus. My, my grandfather was a mad guy, and so I, just, I get it honestly. So that's just who I am. No. Not if you have the Holy Spirit. Your new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. You choose to walk in sanctification. Be angry and sin not. Mm, is that possible, Jesus? Yeah. Do not let the sun go down your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give whom, him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Well, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. All right, I've said that. But Jesus is calling me into holiness. He's been calling me into holiness ever since I accepted his call to salvation. And Jesus doesn't let any corrupt word proceed out of his mouth. And so I have no excuse because he's given me every bit of power from the Holy Spirit. 
to speak holy. Let no un corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's what the process of sanctification looks like in the flesh in real time. All of those decisions are on us. They are our responsibility and the proper response to the love of Christ. And he is saying to decide to live sanctified, to choose holiness. Every behavior that doesn't look like Christ is not okay. Jesus wants us to be holy. He wants us to be holy in every area. He has given us also the power to be holy in every area. But here is the harsh reality that sometimes we just don't want to be. I love you, church. I wish I could preach a, a message that was so encouraging that we're like, oh, you're empowered and you're blessed and you're prosperous. Nah. This is a hard reality. Sometimes I just don't want to be holy. And it's not God's fault. I have no, no excuse to say, God, if you had just delivered me from that temptation, God, if you just made it easier, God, if that person just hadn't cut me off, I wouldn't have told them they're number one. <laughs> Sometimes I just don't want to be holy. And we, might, we may not understand that when we came to Christ, we were commanded to surrender all to Him. When Paul says, you have died and you have laid the old man down, that, that, is, that is surrendering everything to Jesus. Every choice, every lifestyle choice, every action, every decision. We have the power through Christ and the ability and the strength through Christ to go out and run in holiness. We have the ability. The problem is choice. My nine-year-old daughter comes up to her 47-year-old dad quite often and says, Dad, can we go play on the trampoline? <laughs> it's a dumb mistake to buy a trampoline <laughs> and put it in the backyard because I've had two motorcycle wrecks and this knee just doesn't do very well. And then she invites me to go run through the backyard and play chase every once in a while. I don't know if you know this about me, but I don't run that often used to I used to could run but now that I'm not used to it when I do run guess what happens I know where all of my injuries are <laughs> everything hurts and also being 47 there's a weird phenomenon in my brain that every time I do run I begin fearing what I've seen on America's Funniest Home Videos with older men where they run and all of a sudden their head becomes so much more heavy and they fall forward while they're running. Yeah, I'm terrified of that for some reason now. I don't know what the switch for that just flipped on in my body about a year ago, right? So every time I run, it's like, ah, this is not fun. It would not be the case if I was disciplined to run all the time. If I was exercising and if I made an effort to go and do what my body needs. And that, I mean, running is beneficial. It has its benefits. If I ran more, I would feel good about running. But I don't run, and so it's uncomfortable when I start to run. For many Christians, we get sedentary in a lukewarm status of Christianity where we are blessed with the benefits of Christ, but we don't want to walk in holiness because it is uncomfortable because we don't want to be holy. And so it's uncomfortable. But the more we start running, the easier it is to run again and again. 
And the more we start running, the more we find the fulfillment in it. And the more we start running, the more we understand that I was made to run. And I've been empowered to run. And I've been given the tools to run. And God has blessed me with the energy to run. And he's anointed me to run. And in holiness, if we would understand that there is no other God-willed option for the Christian life except to aim for perfection in every decision, every action, every lifestyle, every choice, every word we say, everything that we do, aim in that decision I'm going to get holiness in this. I'm going to throw this axe, and it's going to hit holiness right square in the middle of the bullseye. That is the walk of sanctification. And church, we must step forward to that. That our lives would be a blessing to the Lord, not offensive to Him. We don't do that because we want to get healed or we want to be blessed or we want to find our calling or we want to have success or success in ministry or maybe God will allow me to marry the right person or do the right thing. We don't do that for all of the benefits. We do it because of who He is. That's it. Because He's the one that looked into the void of nothingness and spoke, let there be light, and created all this. So He's in charge. Because of that, I will submit to Him. But I haven't because I haven't wanted to be holy. Some of us, like me, need to repent. Rededicate our lives to Christ. Say, I'm sorry, God, I need to do over. I need to repent of my carelessness. I need to repent of my apathy. I need to repent of my excuses. I need to repent, Lord Jesus, of my love for the carcass that I'm carrying around that every once in a while I like to go back to. And I believe that that's what God is calling us to today. The worship team's going to come. We're going to sing a song of response about laying our burdens down to the Lord. Some of us understand exactly why we are hearing this message today. Because it's for us. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, for praying for us. Thank you for the recording of that prayer in the book of John. Lord, I have heard your truth, but only accepted part of it. I've accepted the fact that you've made me holy in your eyes, and you've given me your righteousness in heaven. But I haven't believed that I need to aim for perfection here. taking your grace for granted time and time and time again calculating that I can go ahead and sin and just ask forgiveness later and it has been an offense to you humbly Lord I thank you for not condemning humbly Lord I thank you for not tossing us away humbly Lord Jesus I thank you that he who began a work in us is faithful to complete it. I thank you, Lord, that you have granted us mercy. We come before your throne of grace in Jesus' name with mercy. Lord, you look upon us with mercy and you love us. I confess that I have not loved you, Lord. I've not loved you with my words. I've not loved you with my actions. I've not loved you with my choices. I've not loved you with my compromise. I've not loved you with my cowardice. I've not loved you with the idols that I place before you every time I go do something else when you're calling me to be intimate with you in prayer. I'd like to repent, Lord. I want to rededicate my heart to you, Jesus. I ask your forgiveness and say I'm sorry. So, Lord, I want to take this burden and I want to lay it at your feet, this burden that I have of being double-minded. I don't want to be double-minded anymore, Lord.
I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again.